here this morning while we are struggling with dealing with Christmas hangovers. I guess we have some that are not feeling well. Some of them are not here. Uh, we have others that maybe they'll be traveling back and forth uh, from family uh, get together. So pray for them. Um, just continue to pray for one another. There's prayer sheets there in the foyer. And but we are glad that you are here this morning, and we'll go ahead and begin our services this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, and we are continually reminded of how good you've been to us. Father, we notice sometimes the big things that how you've protected us or kept us going. You've given us another day to live on this earth and to serve you. But Father, I want to thank you for just the many little things that you do in our lives. That you encourage us. You help us. You, your word becomes um, meaningful to us. Father, help us this morning as we enter into the services, Father. Uh, there may have been some that are here that are struggling, different trials going on in their life, circumstances aren't what they would want them to be, uh, they may be having some uh, physical illness, may wish that they would just hurry up and get through it, but Father, all of these things, as you said, if we are your children, are for our good. Uh, we may not see it, we may, it may not seem good, in fact, it, it may seem downright awful to us. And yet, Father, help us to claim your promises today that you are still working in our lives, that you are on the throne, that you are sovereign, and that you are working these things for our good. Father, help us as we go into the services this morning, help them to honor and glorify you and all that's said and done. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Again, before we sing Philippians 2, 5 through 11, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, but not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow all things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Let us stand and sing, good Christian men rejoice, good Christian men rejoice. Thank you. 
Bible for our Old Testament reading. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, page 38. Page 38. And if you are able to, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. We will do verses 1 through 11 this morning. Verses 1 through 11. We'll do it responsibly. I'll do verse 1. You all will do verse 2 and so forth and so on. So let us begin with Genesis chapter 26, verse number 1. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine, that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him, and said, Go not down to Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell to you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham, thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, She is my wife, lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife, and how saidst thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done to us? One of the people might lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Thank you, and you may be seated. And the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Let us sing, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and we will meet you in unison. 
Let's begin with verse number one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof we heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of the pastor, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Thank you. May be seated and may the Lord have a blessing to his word being read. This morning, let us sing our final hymn before the sermon, O Holy Night, O Holy Night. O Holy Night, the stars of light they shine, it is the night of the dear Savior's birth.
playing for us. If you would take your Bible, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Many of you know I like to have, like to go into books of scripture so I know where I'm going next. And uh, we have finished the incarnation of Jesus Christ over the last four weeks of Advent. And trying to figure out what we're going to do now for this Sunday, possibly next Sunday. I'm not sure how things are going to work out over the day. We are partaking of the Lord's Supper, and I don't remember the last time, or if I have it all, I did go through my notes on preaching the Lord's Supper. And so as we look at the Lord's Supper this morning, I ask the question to you. What is it? What is the Lord's Supper? We've been in church, and many of us, for years. And there is a certain strangeness about the Lord's Supper. Have we ever actually just stopped to think about what's going on when we look at the Lord's Supper? I mean, the strangers no longer strikes us anymore because this is what we do month in and month out. But we step back and imagine for a moment somebody who's never been here before, if they come on this Sunday and they go through the singing, they go through the scripture reading, the praying, uh, the sermon, and then they are hit, if you will, before them with the Lord's Supper. Imagine now what it looks like to a child. I mean, with some differences, I mean, now some of us have gone to different churches, maybe to many different churches, and have participated in different ways of doing the Lord's Supper, and yet essentially it is the same. You have the bread, and you have the wine of the Greek. They receive the bread, the, the pastor, the elder, Maybe a deacon stands up before them and in a ceremonial, liturgical type of way say, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, and then we eat. And then we go through and we pass the cup around. And we say, this is the New Testament in my blood. This do is often you to eat and drink, and then we drink. And that's it. We sing a hymn and go home. What is the Lord's Supper? I mean, what in the world is going on when we partake of the Lord's Supper? And it's interesting because Scripture does anticipate that question being asked. If you were to go all the way back to Exodus, you have to turn there, but if you were to go all the way back to Exodus, when the Lord instituted the Passover, God anticipated that very question being asked. And he tells Moses in Exodus chapter 12, verse 26 and 27, And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he spoke the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their head and worshipped. The Lord knew that the Passover would require explanation. He also knew that the Israelite children would wander every year when it comes to the Passover. What are we doing here? What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? Why are we doing these rituals? We should expect nothing else or nothing different from our own children or from people who have never experienced the Lord's Supper. And so when someone asks you, what is the Lord's Supper, how do you respond? What, what, somebody, have you ever had this conversation with someone, and they've asked you, why do we do things like this? Why does everybody take broken, stale bread? Why does everybody drink juice? Why? To some people eat stale bread and some people don't. Why do some people drink the juice and some people don't? What, what do we mean by the Lord's Supper? And, and for many of you who have uh, been with us in adult Sunday school, we have spent at length 
dealing with the Lord's Supper. And so I'm going to try to distill those teachings of Sunday school into a few messages. And so we begin at John chapter 6, looking at verses 22 through 40. And he says there in verse 22, the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth until everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And he said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? I mean, it is interesting as you go through this conversation that he's having with these people. They don't want to see the work. They've just seen the work. I mean, this is the epitome of mankind when it comes to God. Jesus, show us a miracle. Jesus just showed you a miracle. Just the day before, feeding the 5,000. They want to see a miracle again because they want to be fed. So this is interesting how they ask him, show us again, there in verse 4, what does thou work at the end of verse 30? They say, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you, you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, Thou ye shall also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all that he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our message this morning. Father, we thank you for our time together. Father, we thank you for how you have instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, Father, we could go in many number of different directions this morning. But I ask that you would help us this morning. This is something that you have instituted for us and something that we should reflect on and meditate on. Something that we should think about. Father, help us this morning and this evening as we deal with the Lord's Supper that uh, we would not only be hearers of your word, but the doers of your word as well. Father, we ask that the Spirit to illuminate the scriptures for us that we may see and understand. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. As we, as many of you know, if you have been to Sunday school, over the almost five years that we've been here, we have asked questions about why we do things in church. Whether it is from the hymn singing, the psalms, the prayers, the scripture reading, whether it's from uh, what is the gospel, what is a healthy church member. Uh, we've looked at what is baptism, what is the Lord's Supper. And as we have discussed those things, the discussion has revolved around, in Sunday school, this was a few months ago now, and it was discussed around our current approach to the Lord's Supper. 
something that I have been dealing with personally since probably since the second year we've been here. The question comes in, why do we do it once a month? The question comes on, why do we not do it more? Why don't we do it less? I mean, that is a question that we should kind of wrestle with. Why is it the only, why is it the only time we do the Lord's Supper only once a month? Should we do it less? Should we do it more? That in the process of time, with much prayer and consideration given to the scriptures, and in the Sunday school hour, as we've had discussions about the Lord's Supper, that we need to look at the Lord's Supper from a biblical point of view. And some of the things that we may look at this morning may cause you to think, wait a minute, why are we making a change? Or why, is it, or why are we doing this way? And I hopefully help to help you this morning as we think about the Lord's Supper as we're going to partake of this morning, but help you as we look at this and try to, again, condense what we've learned in Sunday school down to a series of messages for us to think about, and hopefully for your edification. I understand questions will likely abound, and I hope that they do. I hope some of the questions we'll ask, that we are deal with it this morning, that we will ask some of the questions and that we will answer them. But if you have more questions, please come see me. I'm be more than happy to talk to you about it. Please come see some of the ones who have been in Sunday school. And so for these reasons, I'll be teaching on the Lord's Supper. And, and I hope that, as usual, you would come to me with your questions and concerns, and hopefully you would understand where we're coming from. And again, this has been our custom for I don't even know how long since I've been here. And prior to that, our custom has been to observe the supper on the last Sunday of the month and to use bread and grape juice. My question to you is, why is this our practice? Is there a biblical reasons for doing it this way? Or is it because this is the way we've always done it? And I would... I agree with you that this is the way that it's always been done. It's in our church constitution this way. Again, we have looked at this for some time. And, for the, and the truth of the matter is that for some time I felt that we needed to look at the Lord's Supper differently at a church. Why are we go through the Sunday school hour teaching these things. We need to look at these things from a biblical point of view. And if the Bible points out these things from a different point of view, should we not look at what the Bible says and then do what the Bible says? I personally studied the issue. We've gone through it in Sunday school again. We thought much about it. We've taught and we discussed at great length in the Sunday school hour. And then I would actually put a plug in for the Sunday school hour this is where some of these things are coming from. If you would like to know more about these things, I encourage you to come out for the Sunday School Hour because these are where we have these conversations, we have these discussions as uh, church members, as bodies of the body of Christ. And hopefully we can answer those questions during the hours. But from those lessons and from the discussions within the Sunday School Hour, I would... I think it is a biblical approach to move forward with a more regularly scheduled Lord's Supper. I would probably want to back that up with Scripture so that you would understand. We'll move into the body of the sermon this morning and seek to answer the question, what is the Lord's Supper? We should want to look at it. How should it be observed? Try to give a general explanation to these things. And we'll look at it over the next couple, maybe two or three messages on the Lord's Supper and hopefully help you with these. I ask you the question this morning. Is this something that you ever thought about? Why do we do the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis? Growing up, the different churches that I've been a part of, it was primarily up to the discretion of the pastor. So it could be anywhere from six months, nine months. I've been part of churches where it was never done. I've been in part of churches that it was quarterly. 
And I'm sure each and every one of us has an opinion on when and how it should be done. For the most part, most of us here have been in church for some time and have seen the Lord's Supper done. But if you were to just simply read into the New Testament, asking the question, how often the church considered the Lord's Supper, you would see it as on a weekly basis. And hopefully I can show you that as we move forward over today and maybe into this evening. So if the Bible, if the New Testament church in Acts and in Corinthians, which we see these passages, if they participated in a weekly church service where they participated in the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis, why would we do anything different? Or we could say, why once a month? I believe, and I would think some within our church community, after having discussions in the Sunday school hour, have hopefully grown in our conviction that the Lord's Supper would benefit all of us more if we participated in a more regular time. We believe that, and I believe that the Lord's Supper is a great spiritual benefit to the people of God, and should it not be withheld from them. In it, we feast upon Christ by faith. The people of God are nourished and refreshed. They're called to repentance and are urged to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In it, the gospel is preached not with words, but through symbols. As many of you know, that there are people that learn by reading, they learn through books, and there are others that learn visually. In fact, I have children that learn by book reading, and they learn that way, and I have another child that learns more visually. And if we are to preach the gospel through word, and to preach the gospel continually through word, and I hope that you have uh, come to appreciate the gospel preached from this pulpit, would it not behoove us then to show visually the gospel on a more regular occurrence? And if the Lord's Supper is such a good thing for us, why would we withhold this good thing to only once a month? Especially when the scriptures seem to indicate that it was on a more regular basis. The objection that comes up, we've dealt with this objection in the Sunday school hour, and probably you're probably thinking about this one well, won't it become routine? Won't it become common? Well, if we do it more regularly, wouldn't it just not become more, would it become less special? But to that objection, I would say, let's apply it across the board then. If we're going to say, well, it's going to become rote and routine, if we do it more regularly, should we then not apply it across the board to everything that we do at church? If we were to take that line of thinking, then we should only gather together once a month. Because we're afraid that it would become rote or routine. And I would think that we would all agree that, that way we shouldn't do that. Agreed. Should we then not only just preach once a month because it may come rote or routine? Should we only sing the hymns once a month because it can come rote or routine? Should we only do the psalters once a month? Should we only pray once a month? Should we take up the offering once a month? And for most of us, I would hope you would say, well, no, we should do all of those things. When we regularly meet with the Lord. But are we not tempted then to say that the prayer and preaching and singing can be routine? I mean, if we were honest with ourselves this, this morning, thinking over the last month, 
How often did you think about the words which you sang over last month? And how often did you think about the words we were reading during our scripture reading time? And how often did we just sit through the sermon thinking about other things where we would like to be, where we should be, where I need to do this when I get home, I, hopefully this is cooking properly. I wish you'd hurry up and get done. And I'm not the only one who has those thoughts. I've been in the pews. I have thought those things. I have not thought about the words being sung. I have not thought about the scripture reading. I have not thought about the prayer. So I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, those things can become routine as well. But the problem of the not, you know, the problem of something becoming too done, done too much, or routine, if you will, is not that we should do it less often. The issue is, is a change of heart. And we would all agree, right, that we are in constant need of the Lord working on us because this has become too routine in our life. How many times have we gone through our daily devotions, our uh, daily scripture reading, and it's just become monotonous? It's not the word's fault. It's our fault. It's our heart, heart, heart's fault. And it's, it's, it's a change of heart. We need to continually be transformed, as we looked at this morning in Sunday school, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, a transforming of our heart to love the word more, to love the singing of the word more, to love the songs more, to love the hymns more, to love God's word more, to love him ultimately more. But I think God has prescribed a rhythm for our gathering and worship. Right? We do agree that God created on in six days and rested the seventh, and that is the pattern of Scripture throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And He has prescribed what is to be done in worship for us. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continue steadfastly on the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread. Same phrase you see when you see the Lord partaking the Lord's Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The same phrase. And in prayers. And I would say the truth of the matter is, is we would often, we often struggle, if we're again honest with ourselves, we often struggle to come with our hearts prepared for worship no matter what we're doing on a Sunday. It's especially hard doing it the day after Christmas. I mean, how many of you were excited to get up and go to church this morning? How many of you laid in bed and said, you know, I'd like a few more minutes of sleep? But often we, as God's people, struggle to come to the Lord's house prepared for worship, no matter how frequent we come. Or how infrequently we come, we struggle preparing our own hearts for worship. And as we have mentioned often in the Sunday school hour when it came to the Lord's Supper, how we view the Lord's Supper will impact how often we observe the Lord's Supper. And so hopefully as we begin to answer the question now, what is the Lord's Supper? We will have three points this morning, and hopefully that will help us understand what is the Lord's Supper. Point number one, what is the Lord's Supper? It is a covenantal meal. It is a covenantal meal. As we think about the Lord's Supper, we have the elements before us this morning. We have the bread and the juice before us. It is a meal which reminds us of the fellowship, if we say this might often put it, it is a meal which reminds us of the fellowship, 
or right relationship or communion that we enjoy with God under the new covenant. It reminds us of the fellowship or right relationship or communion, or however you want to put it there, that we enjoy with God under the new covenant. Right? We enjoy a relationship, or we should enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ, do we not? If we are his children, we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is through that relationship, through Christ's obedience, his, life, his obedient life, his death, and his resurrection, that we are now able to be adopted into God's family and be brothers and sisters with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a right relationship. Jesus Christ is uh, the servant, or as we've looked at over the last several weeks, he's the mediator of this new covenant. It is through obedience to God, God used Christ's righteousness, his perfect life, right, as we have learned, that the, our unrighteousness is before God. What God does is when he accepts us into his family, takes Christ's righteousness, and as the New Testament says, clothes us in righteousness. So when God the Father looks at you and me, we know that we are sinners, but God, through the lens of Jesus Christ's perfect obedience, sees us as righteous. So when we observe the Lord's Supper, there's a reminder that we are in covenant with God through faith in Jesus Christ. For sake of illustration, how many of you would eat with your enemies? There's someone that you don't like. Are you going to go out to eat with them? I guess depending on the place, it might do it. But how often would you invite them to your home and eat with them? When we eat with someone, it indicates that we have a relationship with that individual. And not just any relationship, but that we have a right relationship with that individual. Sharing a meal with someone is a powerfully relational thing. You are sitting with that individual. You are saying that I agree with you, that you're actually having fellowship. You're enjoying being in each other's company. think about this. The Lord's Supper is God inviting us to share a meal with him. Why would we refuse it? Why would we say, Lord, I only want to participate in a meal with you once a month. Because you know, I don't want it to be too commonplace with us. And we are invited to the table with God Almighty. And he wants to eat and drink with us. What a, what a powerful thought, is it not? That the God of the universe wants to eat and drink with you. We come to God initially through faith in Jesus Christ on the basis of Jesus' life, the basis of his death, the basis of his resurrection. We are baptized to signify that. And the Lord's Supper signifies this ongoing, continual walk with God. very interesting illustration. Some have, have uh, used baptism as compared it to a marriage or a wedding and the Lord's Supper like an anniversary. As one author says, while baptism represents, represents a kind of I do between Christ and his bride, I am going to walk in the newness of life. 
Right? That's what we say when we baptize. I'm going to walk in newness of life. The supper repeats an I continue statement of love from Jesus to the church. So not only is God wanting to eat with us, to fellowship with us through the Lord's table, he is also saying on a continual basis, I love you, look what I have done for you. We see it visually represented. This is Christ's broken body. This is Christ's blood poured out for you. This is God's broken, Christ's broken body given to you. And we are continually reminded of what Christ has done for us in a visual illustration. think about it, the baptism and the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, you could say even Eucharist, I know that's a, some Baptists think, well that's a Catholic term, all it means is Thanksgiving, are a word of God to us. I mean, isn't it awesome to think that when we give the gospel to someone, the same thing's being said through the Lord's Supper and through the baptism? It's just visually represented to us to be reminded of the gospel. It's the same message. The difference is form. Whether it's you going to the streets and talking with one of your friends or someone you work with, giving them the gospel, or whether it's us sitting here as a community of believers looking at the illustration that God has set before us and saying, again, we are reminded of the gospel. I mean, isn't this wonderful news to be reminded that we have a right relationship with God the Father? I mean, isn't that wonderful? No, despite what we have done, that we are in a relationship with God the Father. And God the Father, despite what has happened even before coming in these doors this morning, that God says, I'm in a relationship with you. Come, eat and drink with me. It's to continue to remind you, no matter it doesn't matter what we have done, because it's all based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. And that is the reminder that we have every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. No matter what we have done, Jesus Christ has done it already for us. He took our sin. He took our shame. He took our guilt. So that we can receive righteousness. We who are in the wrong are made right by Jesus Christ. I mean, think about just meals in general in Scripture. They are significant, are they not, in Scripture? I mean, just think of the Passover feast. Every year, the Israelites had to sit down and have a meal together. And it was to remind them, as we looked at already this one, to remind the people of Israel of their relationship with God on the basis of God redeeming them from the land of Egypt, bringing them out of the land of Egypt, bringing them through the Red Sea, so that they may worship Him, in the wilderness. If you remember when Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, what was in the context of Jesus doing? He was partaking of the Passover. The bread that Christ gave to his disciples that night was the unleavened bread of the Passover. 
as we looked at uh, in Sunday school, the cup was the third of four cups in the Passover feast. Just as Passover was a covenantal meal, so to the Lord's Supper is a covenantal meal, which again reminds us that, that we are in a relationship with our God because of Jesus Christ's ultimate act of redemption. Think about the meal that the, the leaders of the nation of Israel ate in the presence of the Lord when they ratified the Old Covenant. Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God. And what did they do when they saw God? Did eat and drink. Exodus. 24, 9 to 11. If you recall back in Genesis, just for a moment, when they ratified the covenant with Abraham, what did the three gentlemen do with Abraham there in Genesis chapter 18? They had a meal together. What is it when you, many people love this psalm, where you're reminded again of it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table. Before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runs over. What is the psalmist looking forward to with God having fellowship, eating and drinking with God? You see this time and time again throughout history, throughout the Old Testament, God eating and drinking with his people. Again, Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it. And break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat this in my body. Again, remember, we have just come off the Christmas season. One of the names given to Jesus was Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Just quickly this morning, two things you see in that is that Jesus is clear that the supper represents the covenant which is made in his blood. So when the question is asked, what is the Lord's Supper? It should be reminded based on Matthew chapter 26 and 29. That this is a covenant renewal. God has made a covenant or an agreement with us based upon his grace. Upon Christ shed blood so that we have a right relationship with him. Again, we are reminded that we have done nothing deserve what God is doing for us. But we are reminded that it was not our body which is broken. We are reminded that it was not our blood, which it should have been, but that it was Christ's body and Christ's blood that was broken for you and I. So when we partake of the supper, we are remembering and we are again renewing the covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is fascinating. Jesus promises that we are going to participate in a future meal together. 
the supper that we enjoy this morning, the supper that we enjoy on a monthly basis, is only a foreshadowing of that great feast that we will experience with Jesus Christ himself in heaven. Secondly, I want us to see that it's a symbolic meal. It's a covenantal meal. It's a reminder of our relationship with God the Father. It's a symbolic meal. We've mentioned it already, but the broken bread is a symbol of his body, the, the wine and the grape juice is a symbol of his blood. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So when we partake of it, we are reminded by Paul to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. I mean, think about it. We are commanded to eat and drink. We are not commanded to look. Are we? It's, it's, a, it's a reminder. The symbolism of eating and drinking is a reminder that it nourishes. Eating and drinking nourishes the body. And we are reminded of the symbolic fact that the eating and drinking of Christ's blood and Christ's body is nourishing, nourishing our spiritual soul. This is what Jesus is getting at in John chapter 6, verse 53. He says, then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life. He's not literally saying, come eat me and come drink me. He, he's given a symbolism to say, come have faith in me. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of that. So we have this symbolism, the Lord's body, the Lord's blood, symbolism that we are in union with Christ. This also reminds that we are in union with one another. We are reminded that you are God's children. You are our brother and sister in Christ, and we are a family here. We should be united. We should be a unified body here because we are partaking of the same substance. We are partaking of the same bread and the same juice. If you want to understand the context of 1 Corinthians, both chapters uh, 10 and 11, Paul is castigating the church. For in that passage of scripture, Paul is telling them, you act as if you are one body by eating and drinking of the bread of Jesus Christ and of the blood of Jesus Christ. But yet in reality, you are in dysfunction. He's basically saying you guys are hypocritical. Because in reality, the, the rich people of the day were eating and drinking everything and leaving nothing for the poor people. And Paul is telling them, no, that is not right. You are to be of one body and one soul. So act like it. So when Paul tells us that towards the end or towards the middle of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he says, do these things, many are weak or sleeping, is because they are not church unity. Obviously, we could take that and apply it to other sins in our lives, but the main point that Paul is making is there, are, there is dysfunction within the church. So we are reminded that we are to be a unified body. We are united by faith in him, and we are being united to him individually by means of the supper. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. So this is a 
covenantal. This is a symbolic meal. This is also a spiritual meal. I mean, I love the idea that God has adopted us into his kingdom. And I love the idea that now because God has adopted us into his family, he feeds us. And obviously we can get into the views of how people view the Lord's Supper. We don't have time to get into that. But what we have seen, what we've read, what we've studied, that we, we take like John chapter 6. Jesus says, eat me, eat my body, drink my blood. He is not saying that we should go eat him physically or drink his blood physically. But he's saying we have to partake him in faith. And this is exactly what we're doing. We are reminded as we take the Lord's Supper that we are taking Jesus by faith. He is nourishing our spiritual souls. Our Baptist forefather said it this way. Worthy receivers, outwardly partaking of the visible elements of this ordinance, do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally or corporately, or corporately, not corporately, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally, but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, it is more than just a remembrance or a memorial. Yes, we do remember what Christ has done for us. We do remember that Christ's body was broken for us. We do remember that Christ's blood was shed for us. But we are also nourished spiritually. We are fellowshipping with God, the God of heaven, every time we come to the Lord's table. And we should praise the Lord that we have the opportunity to be renewed by the covenant, to meditate on the symbolism of the Lord's Supper, and to feast upon Christ and the spiritual meal. Praise God that we'll have more of this good thing in the future, that we will be reminded, that we will see and partake of Jesus Christ more. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Father, help us as we think about these things, as we think about the Lord's Supper. Let us something that we would become too low to too routine, but that, that we would thoroughly enjoy being able to come to God's table presented by God Himself so that we can see and be reminded of our covenant with God, our covenant with one another. And be reminded of all the things that you have done for us. To be thankful for what you have done for us. To be thankful for what you are doing in and through us at this time. And these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing for our final hymn before the meal this morning. It came upon a midnight fear. It came upon the midnight fear.
Father, as we come before you this morning in preparation of partaking of your table and fellowship with you through this ordinance. Father, we are reminded again that we are new people. Father, we are reminded of how Unlike Christ, we really are. And we are reminded of our sin and our wretchedness. We're reminded of our pride and our selfishness and our unbelief and our apathy towards you. I pray that as we partake of the supper this, this morning, that we would have a renewed vigor towards you and your relationship with you. And our relationship with one another. Father, we ask as we think about the bread this morning, 
that is broken for us. That you died death that brought shame and the curse of God upon you. So that we who are under the curse, we who are under shame, we who are under sin, might be able to walk as we say we do our baptism, walk in newness of life. Father, help us once again as we walk. That that would be a reminder to us as we partake of this table that we are continually walking in the presence of you. These things we ask in your son's name. and humbling at the same time that the God of the universe wants to have a meal with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have ones who were enemies with God now who are adopted into his family to have a meal with us. And a continual reminder that this is Christ's body. This is Christ's blood. And he's doing this for you and I. That Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
wasn't enough for Jesus to come to die. He had to die the death of a crucifixion. He couldn't have been thrown off the cliff like we see in the Gospels when he walked right through the crowds. He couldn't have been stoned. His blood had been poured out the cross. The Bible tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life that he gives us as at one point men who were dead in trespasses and sins, as Paul says. He had been given the gift of life through his blood. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let us stand and sing our final hymn this morning. Let the Lamb's High Feast be sing. The Lamb's High Feast be sing. Stop. 